Welcome to Unrestrain, the podcast series from CPI. Here you can enjoy conversations where professionals on all sides of crisis and behavior management relax and open up about themselves, their workplace, and their clients. You'll get the latest tips and trends from the best in the business, so tune in often to integrate their experiences with your own. Hello and welcome to Unrestrained, a CPI podcast series. This is your host, Terry Vitone, and today I'm joined by Tom Loftus. He is a senior level CPI certified instructor and a compliance officer with Community Counseling of Bristol County in Taunton, Massachusetts. Tom has a Master of Science degree from Northeastern University in Counseling Psychology and a BA in Psychology from Boston College. He's a licensed mental health counselor in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Hello and welcome, Tom. Well, good morning. Good morning. Tom, today we're going to deep dive into your work at two residential facilities, the Charles Hayden Goodwill Inn School, a residential facility in Dorchester's Boston neighborhood, and St. Vincent's Home, a residential facility in Falls River, Massachusetts. The first part of our interview will focus on a culture change initiative defined by a culture by design approach as put in motion by Tom at Charles Hayden Goodwill Inn School. Uh, between his start there as a clinical administrator in August of 1986 to his conclusion as program residential coordinator in August of 1995. Uh, Tom, can we begin today by having you describe the Dorchester neighborhood in the mid-80s and the unique challenges that post-desegregation Boston attitudes presented as they filtered down to the culture at Charles Hayden? Uh, Sure. And I uh, grew up in, in another neighborhood in Boston, High Park. Okay. So I am not only, you know, familiar with Dorchester being a, you know, a Boston resident. Desegregation uh, began when looking at how schools were and funding for schools in the various neighborhoods of Boston. It was found that in minority neighborhoods that the money wasn't there, the investment wasn't there. And the remedy was a court remedy to do busing or desegregation. Okay. And during that time, it really kind of blew the lid off underlying racial tensions. A lot of the neighborhoods were basically uh, homogeneous as far as race, ethnicity, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And unless you were working with somebody from a diverse background, you didn't really have those opportunities to connect. And during that time, there was a lot of violence. People were fighting to get their kids out of, you know, if they were going to be bust. Racial tensions certainly were in the schools. The schools had metal detectors and those kind of things. My father used to do the radio reports for the city of Boston during that time. And he would, you know, talk about the various, how many people got stabbed, how many fights, how many arrests, that sort of thing. And that's what permeated the time of desegregation. Uh, To look at it now and working together, I was this new uh, clinical administrator in charge of a unit, a diverse staff, and the same racial tensions and, and those sort of things played out in working environments until if you were successful, to be able to learn to appreciate each other, value each other, and then you could you could move mountains. I see. Now, you wrote to me, you said, when I started at Charles uh, Hayden, there were a few hires before me that didn't work out. It complicated matters because of post-desegregation era. Decisions and interactions were seen through a racial lens, and the unit of 12 boys, the identified patients of the agency, were, quote, the worst kids and worst staff. Now, so talk about the culture in place at Charles Hayden when you started working at the facility. Sure. Because you you talked about it a little bit like the revolving leadership that was there. There were other people who were in that position as clinical administrator running the unit, running the program. It didn't work out. And that was just more opportunity for those who worked there saying, okay, who's this person? How long is he going to last? We trust this, you know, this white guy coming in, and that so you have to kind of go against that tide first. Mm-hmm. It was seen as the, the, you know, the worst kids because they were acting out the most, and you know, physical plant damage, kids running away, mm-hmm. fights, those sort of things. And it wasn't that they were necessarily the worst kids; they weren't getting the treatment that they deserved. I see. And I'm- the staff didn't have like. A real identified leadership in plan. How did a boy uh, come to be in the Charles Hayden Goodwill School? Most of the kids were involved. They in various schools, and they just couldn't work with them. 
you would think it was more so about learning issues, and that, and that was certainly part of it. But during that time in Boston, there was a lot of gang violence. I see. And the schools weren't equipped to deal with that. You know, it wasn't uncommon to hear kids in the hallway, your boy shot my boy, and that wow. sort of thing. So you have that underlying tension before you could even get to treatment issues. So the culture in place of Charles Hayden was very tense, and I would, would say, uh, was, it, was, a, was there any productive learning going on when you got there? A- initially, I would say very limited, because if you, can't, if you don't feel physiologically and psychologically <laughs> safe, you can't engage in meaningful learning and no meaningful therapy. Right. So I understand that you developed a new mission statement when you got to the school. Why was that critical and, and what was included in it? It was important looking at it. It needs like to start with the big picture first. Okay. And it's because you're going through uncharted territory. And so by having a mission we committed ourselves to a certain direction and the the direction of quality treatment, valuing each other, working together, you know, those types of values and concepts. Because once we agreed with that, then everything else kind of falls into place. I know it's abstract, but you do need to have, you know, the, the things that you do is the map, but you need a compass to guide you through. And that mission is like that compass. Right. And can you remember what maybe the central statement of that mission was? I, I'm embarrassed to say I, I, I don't remember. There okay. Those things in the time we did it, and I remember that we did it. But it was, I was just, I more remember the, the feeling of it happening and, and, and doing it and how it had all these diverse people come together. Mm-hmm. And we have, like, now we have a common purpose. And that was also part of the beginning of the the learn to trust phase as well, because you're always, decisions can be kind of second guessed, or where is this going? Because a lot of times, if you know, if it's a dysfunctional culture and you try something new, and people basically either hold their breath or like a football analogy, take a knee, Mm -hmm. wait for it to fizzle out. I see. So by having this mission, that kind of puts us, these things that we're going to try and do, we're going to be well thought out, done together. We're going to implement it, and if it works, great. If it doesn't, we together will make some changes to make it work, but we're not going to just let it fizzle. Mm -hmm. Then did you find that statement uh, gave staff more cohesion and purpose? It it did, because there would be times we would discuss uh, in meetings something we want to do, and one of us, would then mention, okay, does this fit with our mission? Mm-hmm. I see. So we would always like come back to it. All right. So a touchstone of values for people to refer back to when uh, there was a question about going forward. Exactly. And it wasn't just our meetings face to face, but it also would govern our behavior outside. And that's where the true measure of it, where you're successful. Uh huh. Well said. Now, I know you adopted a Venn diagram approach there for the development of residential, clinical, and educational teams. Can you describe how that took shape and then began to integrate? Sure. Because you can't just, you know, work on the whole team at once. And I'll use like a football example, just globally. You can't just all of a sudden pull everybody together and you have a team. You have an offense and a defense. So they have their, their, their training that they have to do, even within... The offense, you have your line, you have your quarterback, your backs, your receivers. So if you have to kind of work on those as subunits. The residential part of it, we had basically two teams, Sunday through Wednesday, Wednesday through Saturday. I needed to get them on the same page because a lot of times the Sunday through Wednesday, they're like the uh, toe of the line, you're in school, you know, more structured. And sometimes the Wednesday through Saturday can be, okay, that's fun time because we're going to the weekend. Things are a little, you know, light. And all of a sudden, you you know, the the kids are angry Sunday through Wednesday because (laughs) they're pulling the reins in. And then they kind of let loose Wednesday through Saturday. 
And it's just those kind of tensions. That's, that's one aspect. But the bigger aspect, going back to the sense of mission, is this is how we're going to do treatment. This is how we manage things during second shift and weekends. So the education part of it is the, one of the things that was exciting they did at Hayden uh, was accelerated learning. And just just briefly, what that would do is say if you were, we looked at like uh, some of the, you know, like learning, auditory, visual, kinesthetic. There's also God and his work of multiple intelligences. And we use those concepts to be able to work on the uh, curricula. So say if you were uh, studying a log cabin in social studies and math, you'd be measuring logs. Okay. You know, things like that. This is might sound kind of funny, but in, in a way it is. But what happened was in the six months that they, the first six months they implemented it, reading scores went up 2.9 academic years, math oh, 2. Man. And so, which is, I think, pretty, pretty stunning success. Yeah, that's that's remarkable. And so you're getting multiple years of, of uh, advancement in those base skills in six months. Yes. Wow. So we so not only is you know that that aspect came in there, but we wanted the teachers assigned to our team to be able to continue the treatment that we'd be uh, doing clinically in in second shift to carry into the school. Then the third circle was uh, myself with the uh, family therapist. We needed to be on the same page as well. So the whole idea is that these three teams are be- becoming more cohesive. And working together, then it would be easier then to integrate these three circles than, you know, trying to do the whole team at once. Because each one has its own challenges, its own strengths, and all in, in areas to be developed. Well, you mentioned the word challenge, and I'm wondering what some of the most, I mean, what was the most pushback that you got? I mean, what was under the most intense scrutiny there in your role as an administrator at Charles Hayden? Uh, I think... In the beginning, am I for real? (laughs) (laughs) Am I going to stay? So once you get beyond that, then it's okay. The the, is looking at this is how we want to do treatment. This is how we're going to work with kids. The teachers they they used to be managing things on their own, and that's been a part of their profession. So to get them to buy into this team concept. Because usually the teachers are highly educated, very committed. This is my curriculum that I'm teaching with. This is what I'm going to focus on. So there's less, I'll say, extracurricular aspects to it. That's like buying into the team. So that was part of the challenge there. As far as um, clinically, there wasn't that much because it was just, you know, just the two of us. But we just wanted to look at how we're going to orchestrate treatment and being on the same page because they're looking more at you know, various group models, like, you know, as far as systems therapy and, and those kind of things. For the um, residential, it was trying to, it's almost like two teams pulling in the Sunday through Wednesday, Wednesday through Saturday. But I think it's just to really be committed to common values because it's really, it always does seem to work out. You know, you got the hard part of the week and the fun part of the week. Mm-hmm. How to be able to make a consistent environment. I think that that was the that was certainly a, a huge challenge. Mm-hmm. And and falling under the culture by design and culture change initiative that you had there was that was a central uh, measure of success I would imagine. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And it took the whole process to really start to to begin to reach fruition was 6 months. At the end of 9 months it was really solidified. Nice. So the first couple of months, you know, is this going to be consistent? And it just, you have to be very dogged in your approach. Because you can't, because anytime you seem to be either indecisive or not committed, then that's like, a, we'll put doubt in people's minds. Because when you're, when you're changing a culture, you first have to have the, your members buy into it and adopt it and live it. Then it's going to, okay, who's going to be on board? There are a certain number of people, there's not a lot, that are really self-motivated, self-driven. And those folks, you need to get them to buy in right away. They can be your powerful leaders 
one way or another. I think it's Firestone uh, that's like attributed to looking at uh, leadership. It's it's like a U. On the left side is kind of like up on the top is like your mafia dons, your international <laughs> gang leaders, cartel. On the other side, it might be like religious leaders, you know, that kind of a thing. And as you go down, you know, as you go down the U on both sides, you have leaders, but not as powerful. It's easier to get the, the, the thought is the mafia done to become a positive leader than to tell them not to lead. Uh-huh. That's interesting. Uh, so in other words, you, you keep your status and your designation as a leader, but your values change. Exactly. Because mm-hmm. you just, they, they can't turn it off. I, I, that's, that makes a lot of sense from a psychological, I think intuitively we would all embrace that, most of us would embrace that as a truth. Um, and there's actually a clinical proof of this then. Yes. Wow. So you know, that was part of it to get them on board. The people who are uh, the rest... Uh, you know, can they switch into moving from an environment of chaos and embrace this? Then there's some that just won't, and they'll start to, to the the real the negative ones will be you know disparaging you know what's going on, and and you have to kind of just keep keep going with the people that are part of it, and those other folks will all of a sudden it look like a sore thumb. And they'll either quit or be counseled out. You know, that, that brings to my next question here where you said it's very important to have, uh, and I believe you had this at Charles Hayden, a strong lieutenant who you said who buys in with strength plus commitment. Could you speak to that? Absolutely. And, and that was uh, Sheila. She was, a, she was a strong leader. And it's, she was, it's what I was told at first, you know, watch out, you know, for her because, of, you know, she would, she could be very negative and that sort of thing. And when I first heard it, and I'm thinking, about, oh, this is a strong person. <laughs> so, I, you know, I met with her first. And a lot of the work was, you know, with us together, and did, which she conceptually buy into this culture by design, which she did. Would she then be not only committed to it, but able to coach staff? And then we looked at, in like uh, our supervision meetings, that sort of thing, we'd look at uh, each team member, what strengths they have. And then, because that, that person is basically in charge when you're not there. Mm-hmm. And if they're operating, when they're operating in concert, then you're going to be able to see that change happen. Because I'd put in, put in a lot of hours for a long time, and no matter how many hours, if there isn't somebody in the other part of it, to keep it going, it just won't happen. And I found out the she's like one of those people that um, you know got a reputation, but when you put them in the right environment, they're, they're superstars. And she was. That's a note of hope for all of us. I think. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you mentioned something in our pre-interview that you had at Charles Hayden called colloquium training. Could you speak to that? Yes, and that was um, the, the term actually came from Sheila. And what we did is, because after we, you know, we, we talked about the Venn diagram approach, because there are a lot of meetings happening in parallel. And our transition to become a team together, we would have our team meetings three out of four weeks, to say in a four-week month. And on the fourth one, we would do some sort of special training. By workforce, we had anywhere from a GED to a master's degree, the wide difference in education. So what we did is we took special training, and say if it was on um, structuralist uh, family therapy, and we would discuss the concepts of it, go over the theory, then the second part of it is how do we implement this on the unit? And we had all kinds of very interesting, and there were master level concepts, topics. And what that did is by introducing that, it does give the message that, yes, this stuff is advanced. Yes, you can grasp it. Yes, you can use it. And we're going to figure out how we're going to do it together. Hmm. So you were able to take a lot of different levels of education and make a meaningful message that, that everyone in training could comprehend and put to use in the facility. 
Absolutely. This is this colloquy uh, was with just my staff. It wasn't for the whole building. I see. I didn't have, you know, just the way that the power structure was. I see. But at least by, by the discussion part of it, it also enhanced the learning and enhanced how it's, how it's used. It, this, I, this is like a model that I had. It, it basically, if people are involved, they become invested, they take ownership, and they're ultimately accountable. I see. That's uh, kind of like the... Uh... Oh, some of the just-in-time or the, the ownership model that some factories put in place for certain procedures when they would make something. If they gave somebody the whole start to finish of one aspect of production, they found that they bought in because they had a sense of ownership in the product that they didn't have when they were doing a, simply a one step uh, of assembly on an assembly line. So um, maybe there's some of the same concept at work there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's in one of the, the blog articles. I have that in there with the, the culture by design. I know, I know the school uh, uh, invested in accelerated learning training, and you describe that as having a tremendous impact on student education. And you also say the concepts were incorporated into staff training. Could you explain that? Yeah, I'll use a fun example. When uh, I had moved up as like from a clinical administrator, it was very various iterations of being in charge of residential operations. And when I first was in charge of the training, we had a week of training and budgetary cuts and that sort of thing. We were down to like three. Then it was down to two days, and two of those days were you know we were using um, CPI. So we had to have that in there. And there were also a number of topics that we had to cover, like uh, tour of the building, incident reports, those kind of things. So what I do is all the, the new staff, we'd have them in the lobby, you know, waiting for people to come before we would bring them in. And I had a couple of staff, actually three staff. One would be like the acting out kid, and then the other two would be the staff. And all of a sudden, the door would burst open and to see, see this individual starting to yell, and all of a sudden staff just put him into a restraint. And it didn't have to be appropriate at all, but basically the message was, you know, the people and people. Some of the people would be scared. Some of them wanted to jump in, and, and that sort of thing. So then we go like time out, time out. This is something that can happen, and, and this is something we want to avoid. And this is why we're doing the training. So we would start off with. With, with learning, one of the aspects of learning theory is it's best when the group has a common experience that they can work with. You know, if you work from each person's history, say even if they had strong residential background, it's still not going to be the same. So that's kind of just, it's kind of got their hearts going and that sort of thing. But it's, uh, it's pointed to the, the benefits of CPI as we went into that. I see. Another, another aspect is a quick one is when we did the building training, I'd have somebody, uh, I want you to kind of fall, and we're going to write an incident report. And what invariably happened is that some of the group would see it, some of them wouldn't, and okay, this is what happens. You need to be able to be aware of your environment at all times, and if you don't, then how do we then put those pieces together of this situation that happened. So it's teaching them. We had a couple of the, the tour, situational awareness, and writing incident reports. So it's just combining experiences and in-the-moment experiences that we can draw on. I see. Can you talk about the concept of therapeutic recreation? Because I know you had that in, in practice at Hayden. I, I know you've got a great story about the formation and performance of a softball team, I believe that was called the Rubber Chickens. That's right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's, there's two different aspects to it. The uh, the team that we had, I guess I'll go in reverse order. Okay. Because we were seen as the, you know, the identified patient in the building, the concept you had mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. you know, with the war staff and all that. Well, we decided we're going to challenge the the building to a softball game. And, you know, on paper, we were, you know, it was half men and women. Our right fielder was seven months pregnant, never played softball before. Oh, right. They had all, all uh, male staff on their team. And on paper, that they should have trounced us. 
we beat them. And, you know, it's just through teamwork. And um, we uh, then we played them again. And this time they had kids in their team. We won again. We uh, mm-hmm. took the... We, Went into the um, the dining hall on time. I'm trying to think of the name of the song. Uh, it's one of those like epic mu- instrumentals. Anyway, you had that. Um, Sheila had the boombox, or somebody else had the boombox, and she and I had both sides of a pillow with the rubber chicken on it, <laughs> and caught it into the dining hall. We kind of rubbed it in a little bit. I, I, <laughs> we were a little competitive. I see. Well, I, after pulling together the team like you did to win with the with the say the broad broad range of athletic talent that was on your team was quite something, especially when you were playing against kids who were in their prime. Yeah, and it was that. And I think it was also the culmination of our working together as a team. All of it. Right. Together. It was just that this event was just, you know, it was just a lot of fun for us. And just an uh, just exclamation mark on how uh, cohesive uh, the team and inspirational to each other that the team had become. There's another layer that I mentioned about the team buy-in and, and people being on board and whether they make it or not. Uh-huh. Next part is like a public relations campaign outside of the team because outside they still looked at us as, you know the, the who are, you know who are they the, the downtrodden and, and that sort of thing. So we, I, I looked at it, I, it's kind of like did I arrange like to have a a campaign and would start to highlight some of the things we, that we had done and I would started that around month six, and then I did you know more as as, as we moved towards month nine. Then all of a sudden I was able to get buy in from other people to see that we had changed. And then after a while, with the people who were still saying negative things, they stood out. They were, uh-huh. you know, that they weren't part of the, the being on board the train, so to speak. I understand. So then that's, that's all of this stuff kind of culminated together. Just the softball was, a, I think, one of a visible kind of way to show that we had changed besides the way that we had done clinically and that we were on con- in control and the kids were moving forward in their treatments and that sort of thing. That's a celebration of the, the culture change that you had affected at the facility. Yeah, and, and that we had done together. Great. And to wrap up about Charles Hayden, I'm going to read a quote you sent me about the work you did there. Quote, any training designed and given started with theory and always ended with how, how it could be implemented, made it real and made it more likely to be enacted. So how much of a difference did training make in the dramatic turnaround you saw at the school between 86 and 1995? It goes back to that, that same model you're talking about was the way that the, the colloquium mm-hmm. it was. And I've, because I've been to a lot of trainings, as I'm sure that the listeners have, and then you, you see and hear all these great ideas and, oh, I can't wait to implement it. You get back to work and it sits somewhere. Mm-hmm. So... I've always thought of my trainings as, okay, let's present this material, but let's build in time of how to use it. So that does a couple of things. One is it shows that there really is utility. It isn't just like a, a wonderful theory and, and you know, if all the planets are aligned, it'll work. So that then you get the buy-in there. And then the other aspect is then how do we use it and like with it was on our unit, then it was, okay, how do we use it with specific kids? If it's a broader level, then how can folks bring it back to where they work? With, then they'll have a map to be able to do it. Because once you get back to work, you tend not to have much discretionary time. The discretionary time is either having some built-in time to work on it, or if you're self-starter, making the time to be able to see this thing that could be very valuable to actually implement it and use it. So it's, it's trying to take it to the next level because ultimately, if something's really going to change, you have to keep focusing on it. And that's kind of beyond the scope of trainings with people or external to, you know, you, to who you do, who the, who's being trained. I see. Well, let's transition now to um, St. Vincent's Home in Falls River. 
you were the quality management director at St. Vincent's uh, from November of 2002 to August of 2009. Could you kind of describe the facility in a general way for our listeners? Sure. We were very, when I was there, a very large uh, school. We had uh, long-term residential. We had uh, an assessment unit, um, another short-term program just to, for kids that might be out of the hole for a brief period of time. We had uh, group homes, that sort of thing. Oh, I just want to take one step back just to Hayden for a second. Sure. Only because there's one other cultural aspect. We had a deaf program there as well. And not only, you know, just like as far as culture, as far as black and white people working together and, and teams working together, we had basically most of our other staff were non-signing. And a lot of the deaf staff, you know, couldn't read lips. Not that they should have to. Okay. So it just comes down to there was, you know, like a barrier there. So it started off, um, one of the um, deaf staff, you know, because we had, we had rotating building supervision. They'd be in charge of the building second shift. Each one of the programs, they'd take turns. But nobody in the deaf program was part of that. And he said, you know, why can't we be part of it? We should be. We're equal and as well-trained as everybody else. And I said, you're right. So I brought it up to leadership. They agreed. And then as we're looking at also on another level, that's to just show the equality of leadership. If there was a restraint type of situation and backup was needed, either deaf staff would be coming to hearing units, hearing staff non-signing going to the deaf unit. And sometimes the hearing staff would just take over. You know, and, it's, and that would totally disempower the deaf staff. I would expect so, yeah. So we, you know, learned uh, the sign for restraint and that sort of thing. And when any of the times our hearing staff would go up, they would be directed by the deaf staff and what to do. And, and vice versa, so that way they'd be valued and utilized. But it was just a, it's sick of it also not as a cultural barrier, because there is deaf culture. And another great topic at some point, but is also then the, our culture of inclusion and to, use, to value each other and let them run their unit and the other folks run theirs. Because when you do a restraint and, and with someone who's deaf, you do the restraint, but you have to have one of the hands kind of loose so they can kind of sign. I see. Uh, another challenge. But that did a, a real, that was like the next step of growth. And I think we were ready for it at that time because we kind of got beyond some of the other challenges that we, we discussed earlier. That's fascinating. I, that could be a blog post on its own, Tom, I think. <laughs> I, I think you're right. And I learned a lot about deaf culture. They, they, some of our deaf staff would even teach like a deaf culture and talk about uh, like Martha's Vineyard and how that has to do with it. Oh, Deaf um, American Sign Language is based on uh, French, uh, the way that they speak their language. It's just, it's just so much. Fascinating. Yeah. Wow. So I guess we go back to to um, St. Vincent's. Mm -hmm. I just thought that might be interesting. Just oh, I, I agree. I'm glad, cultural you, aspect I'm glad you brought it in. Negotiated and was to the betterment of everyone. Excellent. So, so how does someone come to be at St. Vincent's Fall, home in Falls River? Actually, it's the, the same thing as far as um, Hayden. Okay. You know, there were kids that uh, weren't able to make it in public schools either because of learning issues okay. or behavioral issues, more frequently both. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that therapeutic recreation played an important role at St. Vincent's, and I wondered if you could talk about how you used it to generate Malou development and how it featured in the creation and development of something called your team model. Right. So what, um, this is, and fortunately this happened at the, the tail end of my career at, at, at um, St. Vincent's, but it's needed to be able to kind of get the right people involved. So actually the therapeutic rec itself is a model that we're uh, to increasing uh, challenges that it's a way to kind of enact therapy, and that, that sounds kind of broad and global. 
And the, the lower levels of like therapeutic recreation is you're just trying to build trust. Okay. So that might be like you have one person in a circle, everybody's around them, they cross their arms across their chest and kind of like fall backwards. And they get kind of passed around, you know, through, through the middle. Okay. So that kind of thing is, and that's because you kind of putting, well, you are putting trust in the group that they're not going to drop you. And it's set up if everybody's in close, even if somebody's heavier and larger, you can still have several sets of hands on them to do it. And when you do the activity, then you you talk about the what, so what, now what that you go to, to process it. That's where the real action is, not the activity. So what, hap- so what is just basic uh, left brain kind of observation. You're not trying to get into any real affective content at that at that point. So that's what so what about that? And then you kind of get into the dynamics that happened. Oh this one didn't push. I had to push for them. Um there are all these things are metaphors of how they act on the unit, you know, as far as and how they act in the classroom. And then the now what is, okay, we have this education, what are we going to do with it? So, it, and you do that, and and because if you're talking about these in therapy, yeah, you might be able to make a difference, but it's really milieu therapeutic rec approaches are what really sets the tone, because it's like with Trishman's book, The Other 23 Hours, you know, the whole idea is the therapy session, no matter how powerful it can be, it can be undone in a second. I see. Aiden, you know, as soon as you go in there, great session, the kid goes, your mother this. Boom, it's all over. All right. <laughs> so those are the kind of things that, that you do that. And it works all the way up to what people do, like the, the high wire kinds of stuff. But you have to try to, you're trying to develop the group and, and through the various stages. And the, the, the stages might slide up and down a little bit, but you target your techniques for that. Now, one of the premises of the team model is that increasing levels of perceived social risk are indicators of progress. Can you break that down for us? Yeah. Um, so let's see. If, like when somebody is just first coming, like the trust aspect of it, we're just trying to do some of the activities there and we look at, okay, so what level are folks on? And and this is as, as a collection. Uh, I'm trying to think of what's a good way to describe it. There's a way that I compared group models. And there's the work of um, Gardner. The old, the old theory is like forming, storming, norming, performing. That was like the, the original view of groups. He had done something similar to that, but he broke it down into five stages. And the team model that we came up with actually has seven. And the the stages were icebreaker, the individizer, trust and empathy, communication, on and on. So the icebreakers were just trying to provide opportunities just to begin to, to be comfortable with each other. So very low social risk. Exactly. Exactly. And I'll skip a couple, trust and empathy, that stage is for the group to trust physically, psychologically, emotionally each other. Um, So something like that, you might um, come to like a a low wall and you have to help each other over the wall. So that requires, you know, there is some physical touch there. You have to know that the guy is giving you 10 fingers, a girl is going to keep it there till you can get up till somebody can grab your hands and help pull you over. And then the last one, if you have to go through the last two, is social responsibility, where you can build on everything you've done and have higher challenges. And personal responsibility are challenges that really put people to their highest, highest level. I see. So there has to be... Some of them are physical. Some of them can be you know, not as strenuous. But trust being a critical, uh, one of the assets the team would start to cultivate would be mutual trust. Exactly. Okay. The whole idea is you expect that 
to transfer outside of the experience. I see. Mm-hmm. And by having something physical, it, it seems to not only is it multimodal, auditory, visual, and kinesthetic, but it gives them also, it's like if you look at it from a athletic point of view, taking repetitions in, the more rep, reps you can get, the usually the, the better your technique is. Right. Well, here, these, these are interpersonal repetitions. And that when you get to the, the so what, now what? So now what is hopefully then when you're not doing the activity, that when they're on the floor together, they're going to be able to work more cooperatively. I see. Now, I understand that you had CPI training uh, there at uh, St. Vincent's, and I'm wondering if you could speak to how the training and the concepts of CPI presents figure into the success of Culture by Design at St. Vincent's. So with, um, with CPI, is because the person, um, actually, I think a, a step back, but it's still addressing the question is, with the, the team discussion that we just were referencing a couple of minutes ago yes. has to do with the kids. Right. Now, how is your staff team together? Uh-huh. So when you mentioned earlier about the perceived social risk and, and increasing as, as you move up the model. Mm-hmm. So the kids are together, but what about the staff? When I was at Hayden, we did the approach through like the mission statement all the way through until, you know, as far as the Venn diagram aspect and training. This was to, uh, taking a totally different approach to do it. We would do some of the same therapeutic rec activities with staff. And to be able to get them to communicate together, to work together. So it wasn't just like, okay, this happened Sunday through Wednesday, this Wednesday through Saturday, how are we going to work it out? Well, now you get the people together, and they have to solve these problems together. New leaders will emerge. Mm -hmm. Um, You can look at how communication happens, um, who is sitting back, who needs to be drawn in? Okay, even if a therapeutic activity, the activity itself falls flat in its face, it still can be good because it's a discussion afterwards. So by having the common values and opening up communication, then that's one of the fundamental things you're doing with the team. Now you're also in part of education is, okay, what stage is the milieu on today? Usually they'll be around the same. Okay, we'll be going up plus or minus one or two. All right, then what do we need to do tonight if things have gone backwards? Um, so we might, how we might run the shift might be different. What if we, things are starting to move forward? Okay, maybe we can do something a little different. So it's having that diagnostic ability. And if you look at from CPI standpoints, you know, at least on the individual level, the crisis development model kind of look at, okay, where might individuals be there? To look at the anxiety stages, I see that as like the redirection zone. Because as you go progress through the model, uh, you're seeing someone who's less and less rational. How do we get somebody to be rational? And now that they're rational, how can we capitalize on that on a group level? Certainly, it's used as individual. We're just talking. We're talking about therapeutic rec, LU level intervention, and also the initial part of the training is looking at nonverbal, paraverbal, verbal communication. So you're able to not only see what's in front of you, but also to own what you are exhibiting in those levels. And um, verbal escalation continue again is another opportunity at the defensive level to be able to to read things, to intervene, and redirect back. Because if you don't redirect it, then you you move up the the stages right. and get to the acting out person. And we're trying to prevent that. We're trying to use the first stage anxiety, and then the fourth stage looking at uh, therapeutic rapport. Therapeutic rapport is built during that uh, now what stage. Yes. So would you say that the CPI training and concepts and learning that uh, behavioral model, like the crisis development model, went towards creating and sustaining 
uh, or created a sustainable culture there at St. Vincent's. It is, and as long as the leaders value it and practice it, uh -huh. that's the key part of it, because as valuable as it is, and as accessible as it is, it has to be part of the, the you know, part of the culture. Right. Then it will have value and meaning and utility. And did you find that CPI training became part of the culture by design at St. Vincent's while you were there? It was already well in, in place before I got there. Oh, it was? Yeah, there's, um, oh, probably for a number of years. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Well, to close today, Tom, uh, I would like to ask kind of a broader question, and that's how does the evolution of the cultures by design built at Charles Hayden and St. Vincent relate in a larger sense to the communities in which they serve? I mean, what's go back to Dorchester. Has, has, it, has there been any real impact? If there was a real impact. I guess we'll never really know because to, to know how well the kids are doing, they're you know, growing up now. Right. Are they having productive life, that's one of the things, the, the downside of residential, I, and I, but I'm glad, is when somebody graduates, there's no mechanism in place to see how they're doing five years, ten years. So you can see when someone graduates that they have mastered certain things, and a lot of it's how can you play well with others. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's the, the educational part of it. If you don't do that, you're not going to be able to hold a job. You're not going to be able to put yourself in, in another environment. Because a lot of the, the kids who are from gang areas, you know, if you don't do anything to give them skills and, and a way out, things will gravitate. I'll just take a quick detour about um, from, from CCBC here, uh, the Children's Behavioral Health Initiative. It came out of... a uh, Court's case, the Rosie D, and basically against Romney, and that's Medicaid, Medicare services for children. One of the things that they, we use high fidelity wraparound is it looks at what's going to happen when the kid leaves. So you help on the family as far as, okay, is it a problem with um, paying rent, finding housing, um, to be able to find... Uh, natural supports, which, you know, it could be, those are the ones that, you know, don't cost anything, like building bridges with people they burnt them with, or having connections to churches, to other types of groups, meeting new people, that sort of thing. Those are the things I think that are missing from, we're missing definitely from Hayden, and I, I'm not sure if they're doing that at St. Vincent's at this time. So that, that's, I guess, to see, because you're asking about, you know, did it work? <laughs> yeah. It, it worked enough to we knew when they graduate, graduated and felt as though that they were a, a stable footing. But I think that when you're, doing, when you're teaching somebody to fish and spending more emphasis on the family, because the, the kid is going to go back to the family, whether it's their family of origin or someone else, there has to be an environment to support them. I think we're expecting a lot more from kids who are in services than your average kid. You know, and and not that all families are perfect, but having a stable parent or parent provides more opportunity for learning and support than for somebody who's bounced around from foster home to foster home, and we're expecting them to be able to, at 18, they're going to pay their bills, they're going to manage their apartment, they're going to have a resume, they're going to be able to do things perfectly. And we all know those kids 18 to 25 that are struggling and didn't have the history that those kids had. Indeed, very true. All right. Any last thoughts for us today, Tom? No, I think that, that kind of covers it. I guess just in sum, it's you have to start... Uh, like Zig, Zig, um, Zig Ziglar said, if you aim at nothing, you'll surely hit it. So let's find something to aim at, and that's our mission. And then from there, then we'll be able to design our training, our methodologies to be able to uh, effectuate change, and then to involve people. So you have the involvement, investment, ownership, and accountability. And from those things, then you can you really can tackle it things, move mountains, 
And that process tells your staff that you believe in them, believe in their capacity, and want to take this journey together. Well, that is certainly the voice of experience, Tom, and thank you. My guest today on Unrestrained has been Tom Loftus. He is a senior level CPI certified instructor. He is also a quality management and compliance coordinator with Community Counseling of Bristol County. Thank you so much, Tom. Well, it's been my pleasure. I'm really uh, glad that we were able to do this together, and I hope there's some benefit and utility for others. Thank you, and thank you all for listening. Thank you for joining us today on Unrestrained. Tune in again soon for another interview with an expert in behavior management. Until then, this is your host, Terry Vitone, hoping your intention is prevention.